Hi guys, good morning. I'm Cheryl Livingston. I'm Laura Hayes. And we are representing AAC Innovations with SSD. And we definitely wanted to let you know about a new interview that Laura did this week with a speech pathologist. Yes, we, um, we are both speech pathologists as a background. And uh, so we enjoy getting to touch base with SLPs everywhere. Um, the one that we're going to interview this week has really great ideas and fresh perspectives. Uh, she's got experience both in partner districts as well as a SSD building at Lipsinger School. Um, so we are very excited to talk to her. How's, uh, how's, how's things on your end, Cheryl? It's good. And you know, we talk about being a speech pathologist. You know, there's so many different ways you can be a speech pathologist. And that's what I personally love about the field. We can do just... Um, I think you name it, there's a speech pathologist involved somewhere. But um, what I'm really enjoying right now is the diversity of the students that I support. And I'm just going to share with you a story. I was talking to a mom yesterday and her little girl has Rett's syndrome. And um, she definitely has been working with her pod book for quite well, several years now. And she's doing wonderful. And, um, and for those who are not familiar with pod, what does pod stand for? POD stands for the Pragmatic Organization of Dynamic Display. So it is definitely wanting to make sure we address the pragmatics of communication, not so much like huge vocabulary that you're trying to name everything under the sun, but how do we get from point A to point B and then what kind of, what interaction might we have in that process? So it's um, started as paper, it's a book that you can then have the branches that lead then, so if a student chooses a branch, it leads you then to another page, which then has more options and they can choose something there, might lead you to another page. So this little girl was, and she's only, I think five now, she um, was using her pod book and her mom was talking to her about, well, do you wanna you know, just chill for a little bit longer? Or do you wanna do some schoolwork? And through the process of using her pod book with partner assisted scanning, she um, isn't able to just point to the pictures. So her mom goes through each column and um, this little girl, you know, affirms that, yep, that's the one I want or doesn't, or she's, you know, gives them a no, not that one. She went through the process. It took about six minutes, mom said, but she all through the different scanning and very patiently, they went through it all. Um, she told, she chose you, and then mom went back through scanning again to, to have you know, more to say. And um, she then chose annoying. <laughs> just telling mommy, you <laughs> annoying. And I told her, I said, oh, just wait. Keep track of how many times she uses that. And the older she gets, I'm afraid it's going to happen more often. But anyway, She's going like, to need like a quick phrase for that. Yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah, so, yeah. You She's annoying. Like, <laughs> and it's, or it's going to turn into a look, right? You know, she's just going to give mom that look like we all see. Um, but it's just that she was, she was so proud of her. But at the same time, she's like, oh, don't tell mommy that. But I was like, oh, no, take that as, yep, she it's did the beginning it of the rest of her life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but the work, you know, again, it took time. But, oh, my God, the, she, you know, she said, I would never know she was thinking that. She might have whined or something, but mom would have probably brushed it off to, oh, you're cranky because you didn't sleep long enough. But she was letting mom know. So well, I think that's so And my big aha is the six minutes. Like, she was so motivated to tell mom, like, bug off. You mm -hmm. are annoying me right mm -hmm. now. I just want to mm -hmm. be me. Oh, that's and, so, and it's she, so yeah, typical. Right. So, you know, stop or, you know, done, finished. Those words probably came up throughout the process, too. But no, she wanted annoying. Oh my gosh, I love it. And that's, yeah. that's some of the beauty in the pod system. Um, when we think about pragmatics, right, we're, we're not just thinking about requesting or labeling, like you said, we really look at like the how I call pragmatics the how, right? How are we communicating? Are we greeting someone? Are we directing someone? Are we commenting? Are we commenting about how annoying they are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> are, you know, are we closing a conversation? Are we asking a question? So many times our kids don't even have the opportunity to ask questions. And so that is a really great system for probing that and supporting yeah. that. And that's what I love about when you look at the options that are in just a, a regular pod book, you can customize them. You can make them be different. But when you just kind of start a pod book, there's stuff that's re there ready to go. You look at that and I, and I have several times went, Oh, that's not even, a, you know, we could have a high tech device that has 50,000 words, but that's not even something we would have had in their device or how would they have found it towards this? I just love how it just leads. It just, it's, it's, but it's not doing it for them, 
but it leads them to maybe you want to say one of these and they can always say no they can always say different you know change turn the page they can always say start over you know but it's just like oh it brand it the branches the, just are so um rich in and the, and the amount of book of communication the amount of interaction and engagement that can go back and forth so yeah one of my faves i love it i mean again being a speechy i uh I love the how of the communication and it always kind of goes back to that, right? How do we communicate? I mean, we communicate, like you said, with a look, we communicate with gestures. What do they say? 80% of our communication is actually through our body language. Nonverbal. <laughs> yeah, nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when we look at um, how we communicate and, and these wonderful stories about how kids are so persistent in in their message. It's just, uh, it melts my heart. Yeah. Um, so, so today we're going to listen to Anne Marie share some stories and insight, uh, about speech pathology and about, uh, just different views and what, uh, supports can look like, especially when you have a team approach, you know, Cheryl, you and I can talk about a team approach all day, but you know, until you hear what it can do for students, I think that, um, you know, the message can, can be lost. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce Anne-Marie Kahneman, a uh, speech pathologist from Litzinger School, and uh, we can listen to her uh, share her message with us. So this is Laura Hayes with AAC Innovations, and today we have the wonderful Anne Marie Economin. Is that how you say it? Yes. Okay, yeah. Economin. <laughs> I, I thought so, but I just wanted to double check. And she yeah. is a wonderful speech language pathologist that has experience both at Litzinger as well as a partner district. And you came to us, remind me, from? Uh, Ferguson Forest. That's right. And uh, before that, she did her master's at SLU and she did her undergraduate at Mizzou. So very wide range of experiences. So we are so excited, excited to have her today to kind of talk about being an SLP and what it looks like at different levels and, and just kind of your overall experience. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. So, um, so how, how did you get started? How did you kind of tell us your backstory? What does, what does the SLP um, experience look like for you? Um, so I, this is my sixth year with special. Um, it's my sixth year as an SLP. So I've always worked with um, SSD um, and I'm just really lucky. I feel like, cause I just feel like I've learned so much um, with my experiences with special. Um, I um, started off as an itinerant SLP. Um, so I was in a number of different schools. Um, I worked um, in a middle school and a high school primarily. And then I also um, did some time at an elementary school. Um, so I've done the whole gamut, K through 12. Um, and then currently my building is K through eight. Um, and it's, it's awesome. I love that I'm able to have so many different experiences and work with so many different kinds of students. So yeah. And so you now have a wide range of skills and a lot of your students are using augmentative alternative communication. Yes. How did you, did you anticipate that that was somewhere you were going to kind of dive in when you were in your graduate program? And what, what did that look like? Um, honestly, initially, no. I mean, it's kind of intimidating if you at first like look at it, especially as a grad student. Um, but I was really lucky when I was in graduate school to be at a clinical placement that had a lot of AAC. Um, and that's kind of what sparked my interest, what piqued my interest in working with um, students who have those kinds of communication needs. Um, I had a really, um, it was a really cool school. And so I was really able to learn a lot doing that. Um, and then I also um, was in graduate school. I took an AAC class, of course, um, taught by one of the AUGCOM facilitators. Um, at, uh, at SLU. So I was able to learn a lot by doing that as well. Um, and then just like my role um, in my last job had a lot of AAC and a lot of um, opportunities to learn and, and things like that. So it just kind of speak, or sparked my interest and I just really enjoyed it. So yeah. that's wonderful. So tell me more about your initial job as an itinerant. So you, I mean, you really worked with a wide range of, I'm sure, skills and ages. So what did, what did a typical day look like for you in there? 
Um, so I, depending on the year, I had anywhere from um, two to three buildings. Um, and my one building was where I primarily had the most um, AAC usage. Um, and it was honestly primarily a high tech. Um, most of the kids were on high tech devices. Um, so I had anywhere from, I don't even know, five to six devices at a time, just depending on the caseload and um, things like that. Um, and so we uh, worked with all kinds of different students, all kinds of different needs. Um, there was a ton of staff support and a ton of collaboration with the staff, which was great, especially because I wasn't in the building all the time. Um, so we were really able to like dive into that and make sure that the kids were getting um, support from all different areas. Um, yeah, tell me, tell me more. What did that look like uh, with the students? So did you have all hands on deck? You know, who, who was kind of directing that since you weren't in the building? What, what did that look like? Um, it was very much a team-based approach. I would say that, like, I, I mean, the, the teachers did know how to edit some of the things um, that they needed support with um, if I wasn't there at that point. Um, and so it was, it was very much just a collaboration between everyone. It was myself, the teachers, the paras were really great about using it too. Um, we did a lot of training initially just to make sure that everyone um, knew what they needed to know for the different um, devices and they were familiar with the devices. Um, and then I always just encouraged, like, if you're not really sure, just model, you know, like if you, if the kids um, aren't using it, model everything, just model, 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 model. And, um, I think that that really helps. And I really feel like I learned so much from the staff. Um, and it also was really helpful because they were able to keep in communication with me if I wasn't there. Like they were able to tell me what was helpful for them. They were able to tell me how the kids were using the devices. Um, and it was, I feel like it was kind of an ideal situation um, in the building. Like, and, and it was the best that it could be, I felt like, just because I wasn't there all the time. So it was really helpful to have as much team support as possible. It definitely so. sounds like it. Now, were they all on the same system or because, you know, we sometimes get that pushback too. Like we want them all on the same device. Did they, did they have different devices in that same classroom? Yeah, there were um, different devices. I felt like a lot of the kids were on touch chat just because of their levels of communication, but they, we definitely had other devices as well. Lamp was in the classroom. Um, we had compass uh, devices in the classroom. Um, dedicated devices. So they were all on um, different things, but I would say that the majority, like if there was to be one that was um, like more prominently used, it was probably touch chat. Um, we also had kids on devices that were um, more for like intelligibility repair and um, things like that instead of for language. And so um, there was different devices like, um, uh, what's it called? Speak? Is it the Speak app? Speak Is it? that the one? Yeah, mm -hmm. where you like type in the word and it mm -hmm. and it says, so we've had that too. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of the whole gamut. And they were also using um, like curriculums that had communication supports built into it and, and things like that. So um, we had when a lot of When you say curriculum things, supports, so. can you give us some of those examples? Like where did they doing word of the week or, because it just sounds like this is such an ideal situation that a lot of people should be tapping into some of their success with. It sounds, it sounds really, really great. Like, did it stem from, like you said, the curriculum and the teacher and just all that training you did at the beginning? Um, I, it was mostly like news to you curriculum. And so like the vocabulary supports with news to you and the um, communication boards with that. I did not do word of the week as much with those kids. Um, I, looking back, I think that they would have really benefited from it, but it was something that I just wasn't as familiar with, with all the core based things. Um, I mean, I used a lot of it in therapy. Um, however, I didn't do necessarily programming based on that. Um, so we did a lot of supports with that. And then I also feel like at that um, age level, um, a lot of it is like curricular supports and like supporting in the classroom as well. Um, across no matter what you're doing, AAC or just typical language therapy. Um, and so we were trying to kind of tie that stuff into it as well. So. And, and you mentioned that a crucial piece being the training that you did at the beginning. What did, what did that look like? Were you the one doing the training or did you have them come to SSD district trainings? Was it after school? What, tell me more about that. Um, we had uh, trainings built in, like uh, they had early release days. Um, and so we would do trainings um, on those days. Um, a lot of it was just conversation too, just in passing, like we would chat about it. Um, it was very much like an ebb and flow. Like we would just kind of go 
and talk about it as we needed to. Um, and uh, I think that they did, might have done some of the district trainings as well. At least the teachers probably did. I can't confirm that though. Um, but it was just kind of like a, a major conversation. I talked to my AAC facilitator um, at the point, at that point, and we, um, she let me use some of her resources and we went through some PowerPoints and um, a lot of it was um, just ha all hands on, on deck, all hands on device. You know, we would borrow the devices and we'd go through them and um, just decide, you know, this is where the word finder button is. This is how you use it. This is why it's set up like this. Um, this is why this student has this kind of device instead of something else. Um, and it was just, I just felt like it was kind of an ongoing conversation. And for those listeners who aren't familiar with Word Finder, a lot of the high-tech speech generating devices do have a feature built in now where you can search for a word and it tells you the path to get to that word on a device. So you can search for a word like park or coffee and um, you can tell where my, my head is at today. Like it's a really nice day. I want to go out and have some coffee in the park, but you can search for those words and then it will tell you how to find those words on the device. So if you're not familiar or if you have like in this classroom, different devices on different platforms, and it's harder to remember those motor sequences, you can search for the word and then it will tell you how to get there. So um, that, is, that is a great feature to teach, teach people as you're getting started. It just sounds like it was a really good environment though. Like you guys really had a positive work environment and just presumed that you could all do it when you were all working together. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I felt like it was ideal. Um, I know that not that it just depends on what building you're in or what kinds of people that you're working with. Um, and for my in my situation in my circumstance, it worked really really well. Um, I know that the kids made so much more progress um, because it was out all day. You know, the device was constantly with them. It was the expectation that they brought it everywhere. Um, and they were using it and um, it was beneficial and people were using it with them, right? Like it was modeled on them and it was modeled for them. And um, I just felt like it was, it was definitely ideal. I, I really, especially since I wasn't there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you work with any other um, students? you talked mostly about that classroom, but in your itinerant position, did you have any more outlier students like at the high school or at another building? Um, not so much at the high school, but um, yeah, I mean, I've, I worked um, with other students using AAC, um, especially, and I also did summer school, so I had um, lots of different kids on devices during summer school and lots of different devices um, with that. Um, we did not have as much low tech in those buildings, um, I think just because of the where the kids were and their language skills, um, and so it was mostly high tech, um, but it, I mean, it was great. I, it was definitely probably the best part of that job. I loved doing all that. I thought it was so much fun. That's awesome. So, so now you're at Litzinger and how long have you been at Litzinger? Uh, this is just my second year. Okay. And so, uh, would you say that you have a higher population of kiddos that are, you're using AAC with at this point? Yeah. Or even just like, um, sub communication supports, even if it's not like a specific system. Mm -hmm. um, lots of different communication supports going on, um, lots of multimodal language and multimodal um, communication programs and, and things like that. So um, it's very interesting. I really like it. So what does a typical day look like for you now? Um, well, I have kids kind of at all levels. Um, I have kids who are um, I just at the beginning, early language stages. Um, and then I also have kids who are at the higher um, language stage. Um, and so I'm just kind of worked through it all day. I mean, um, not every kid I have is on a device by any sense of the word or not any kid I have has AAC um, supports or consults or anything like that. Um, but I do, um, I mean, I do have a lot and it's very interesting and in working through groups and trying to figure out what each kid is on. It's been very interesting this year because I have a lot of new kids on my caseload and we're trying to figure out, you know, where they're at over teletherapy. And um, that's just been something totally new this year, but um, it's been, it's been good. I mean, um, I think that because we, I mean, again, I feel like there's a very much a team-based approach to everything that it really helps. Yeah. And 
you talk about team-based, but now we're looking also at family-based too, right? You know, just yeah. working with the families in their homes as we're doing teletherapy. So have you, have you noticed a change in any of your students or have you noticed a change in how you're doing and implementing therapy since we've started that with them? Yeah, I think it's really cool that we're able to do so much parent training right now, um, even if it's indirect, um, just because of the way that we're showing, you know, they're, everyone is picking up what we've been doing, just like um, teachers do the same, right? We kind of, we're able to kind of demonstrate how we would do things, and then um, people kind of pick it up on their end too. So um, I think it's been really, really cool to be able to see that, um, and to be able to um, support language at home, and to really think about like, um, to think about like what they would use at home and how it can be beneficial um, at home. And it's just been, it's been kind of a blessing in disguise, I think, um, to be able to do some of that. It is tricky though. I just feel like I'm still learning so much and trying to figure out um, what works and what doesn't work. And um, I'm still constantly trying to figure out like, okay, let's get them this at home. Let's try and, you know, work through this situation at home and um, get them the, the supports that they need. It is a little like starting over, right? You've got the technical side of things. Like, could this technically work what I want to do? And then you've got the, are are they going to attend? And like, how's my implementation going across the screen right now? Am I engaging them? It's, it's so, so much. And then, you know, you've got all the other distractions that could possibly be intrinsic and extrinsic factors at the home. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I mean, I'm still like emailing you guys in the AAC department trying to get different things that it's like, okay, you know, we're still, it's October, but we're still trying to figure, you know, figure it out and figure out what works. So. Yeah. But um, you know, we do that when they're in person too, don't we? When we have a new kiddo, we're still always exploring, you know, doing that diagnostic therapy where we're just trying to figure out, okay, is this the right direction? Is this where we want to, do we need to switch it up? Yeah. I, I totally hear you. As far as, you know, looking back through your six years, you know, we talked a little bit about the fact that you, you weren't as familiar with core word of the week. How do you think your, your skills have kind of expanded and what do you feel like is the most important thing you you've learned about AAC thus far? Um, I think that the most important thing I've learned is the modeling piece. Um, I think I picked that up fairly early um, with talking to people and, and doing my trainings, but I do think that the best and most important thing you can do is model. Um, without expectation. And I, um, that's what I always tell people if I'm working with either a new family member or staff or whatever, and they're concerned that their child's not using the device or not using their communication program or system or whatever it is. And I always just say like model, 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 model. I mean, if you're not, um, even if they're not using it, like that's the best thing that you can do. Um, so that's probably the most important thing. Um, and then just, learning. I just feel like I'm constantly learning. I mean, I don't feel like this is something that you will ever know everything in and you'll constantly be picking up new strategies and um, new tools and new programs and things like that. Um, And I just feel like I've learned so much, even in the last year or two, um, where I thought like, oh, I kind of got this down, you know, and then you get into it and you're like, oh my gosh, little did I know, the little I knew, you know. Right, (laughs) the levels. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I just feel like you learn so much. Um, and I also loved, um, trying to, um, pick up just like all the different types of devices that I wasn't even familiar with. They're not even devices, just like communication programs. Um, like pod, I was not familiar with pod at all. Um, and for and those I who love- maybe still aren't familiar with POD, POD stands for a Pragmatic Organization Dynamic Display. And it's actually, even though it says dynamic display, it is a low-tech support system in many cases um, that is pragmatically organized so that we have different, you know, we have different organization systems when we look at how we lay out um, some of our some of our devices and some of our systems. And so POD, it can be put on a high-tech device, but it's mostly known for low tech in the way that it's organized because it's organized by pragmatic functions or how we communicate. You know, we don't just request, we don't just protest, we ask questions, we comment about things. And so it can be a super effective tool as you were mentioning, you know, just yeah. utilizing that. Um, what do you, what do you feel like are some of the benefits of using that new tool compared to some of the other tools you've used in the past? 
I just love that it gives kids the ability to choose their access method. Um, you know, not all kids are able or are able to, you know, access through touch or access through, um, through, I don't know, they might need the visual supports. All, there's just so many different ways that you can implement it. Um, auditory scanning, they can use it visually. Um, there's just so many different ways that it can be implemented and nothing is wrong. I just think that it gives us the opportunity to try and tap into what the kids need. Um, and it works. Like, it's so cool to see it when it works. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I think it's really cool. I really love it. Um, and I also just like the ability for it to be kind of like a visual, like extra support if needed too. Um, since it is low tech, you can kind of pull it out and pair it with other things if you need to. Um, I just think it's really, there's a lot of opportunities with it. Has there been anyone specifically with that that you've got a chance to work with where you're, where maybe someone didn't see the potential and then you introduced a tool and everyone was like, oh my gosh, there's so much in there and they have so much, now that they have AAC, the yeah, I possibilities mean, I are think, endless. I think I've surprised myself. Like not, I, it hasn't been me surprising myself. I think kids have been surprising me with their ability to use um, different devices. Um, I think that, and I also think it's really important as kids get older to try and like rethink some things. Um, what works for them when they're younger may not work for them when they're older. Um, and I saw a lot of that at my last job as well. Um, just thinking about like, okay, this is where their language is at this point. Um, and like, what kinds of support can we give them at that moment? Not to take away anything, because you would never want to take away things, but you just want to give them as much opportunity as possible. For sure. To be able to express themselves. Well, and you, it's, it's funny you say that because I think too, as kids get older, the, I, the expectation and the idea that they will become more independent with their system and it's their system and they have to, they have to use it and almost prove to us that they have all this, um, this potential with the device. And so people kind of stray away from pod sometimes because they're like, well, that's about the communication partner. And I'm like, it's always about the communication partner, right? We always want to have, you have to have two people to talk. Like the system isn't the magic. The magic is in the conversation, right? When we look at right. typical development and all these kids and the language that they have, the magic is in the power of what they can do with it. So when you just have a system, there's not power behind it. When you have the conversation, that's the power and you have to have that engagement. So as much as it's about the, the way it's organized, it's also really forcing someone's hand to be more active and, and an active listener and um, engaged with that kiddo. So that's another reason that I just really like it. Like, you know, just thinking, yeah. thinking differently of it's not about, it's not about the, the hardware. It's about what can they do with it? Well, I also think it's just adding organization to things we're already doing. I mean, some of it is things that we've already, like just in conversations with people we do, um, but it's just adding a, like a more systematic approach to, to it. And I just think it's really cool. Um, That's a great and I, point. I love watching the videos of kids doing it and how well it works and then seeing the successes. It's, it's very cool. Yeah. So. Is there anything that you would go back and – tell yourself as a, as an early SLP, like I was telling someone the other day, I'm like, oh, I did it all wrong. I asked all these WH questions and I worked on colors and identifying things on devices and I did it all wrong. Like I'm, I'm old, I'm older than you. So I feel like there wasn't as much education <laughs> out when I was in my graduate program learning about this, but I, I would go back and be like, oh, I do it all differently. Is there anything that you would say to yourself? Oh, I, I like do it differently. Um, I think that I just wouldn't let myself get intimidated by some, some of it just because it's, I think that like when I was initially learning about AAC, um, I really thought that there was a very specific type of therapy for it. And there is, there are strategies that we use and things that we do. Um, but I, I also think that a lot of it is what we're doing already as language therapists, right? We're doing a lot of these strategies um, to begin with. And so I think that just like kind of like letting myself or telling myself to put away the idea of it's like something totally different versus like this is just an early language user. 
um, and what kinds of things would I do with a kid who's just learning to communicate and learning to express themselves. I love that because I think a lot of people were in your shoes or currently in your shoes, like as far as feeling intimidated by a system or by a situation with AAC. I think that's really good advice. As far as now, what do you feel like is your biggest challenge or something that you're really striving to kind of move forward with, with AAC? Um, I just feel like there's so much to learn and I didn't realize how much there was to learn. I'm really lucky um, to have people that I can um, figure things out with and problem solve with. Um, And I just feel like I'm constantly evolving and constantly learning new tools and new strategies and figuring things out. Um, And that's definitely a a challenge just because you're kind of always have to be on your toes and always have to think outside the box. And, you know, and I, I really feel like um, giving kids every opportunity, you know, and giving them every, uh, like kind of letting them take the lead as far as like what's working for them at that moment. Cause what, what may work for them one day may not work for them the next, um, mm-hmm. and vice versa. And just kind of letting them code switch a little bit with, um, communication and communication programming and software and devices and everything. Um, when you say and code I, switch, if someone's not sure what that means, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So, you know, we have kids on low tech devices, um, who, or even kids on high tech devices who at that moment, like they may not be able to access it or be able to, um, express themselves using it. So you might pull out your, you know, core board, or you might pull out some PEC symbols, um, and may not do like the full PEC programming, but like giving them those visual supports. Um, you may have like a big Mac or a little Mac or something just that's like, so that they can kind of choose just um, in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely multimodal. Um, I, I just think that that's so important. And also like, I also feel like it's so important to honor however it is that they're expressing themselves in that moment. Like if a kid is, is, you know, verbal and that's how they're choosing to express themselves, then like honor it because that's what they're saying. And I wouldn't want somebody to ignore my communication if I'm trying to say something. So Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think people sometimes get hung up when there's the device that they have to use the device, right? And so I always tell people too, just if you have a student and they verbalize something, one of the best ways that you can reinforce it is just to acknowledge it on the device. So if they said something verbally, oh, I heard you say you want to go eat your pretzels. Great. Like, let's go eat it and not make them reiterate it on the device. Um, Because then you're getting both sides. If they ever needed to repair it down the road, they had they know how to do it on their device. You've given them the model, but you've also reaffirmed what they said. I think that's so important because like you said, just the rapport in that knowing you're understood is almost more than half the battle, right? Like just feeling like you can get a message across and you don't have to rely on behaviors and frustration. And, you know, there's, there's not just those moments of communication breakdown. That's such a good point. Um, Okay. So, so wrapping up last question that we we really are going to ask almost everybody on the show is we really just want to know your favorite AAC moment, like a moment in time. Has there been a moment where you just felt like magic happened and like thus far, like what was your favorite AAC moment? It could be something you've had on your journey or something with a student you've worked with. Um, So I think that something that can be really important for kids is um, perception of a device Um, because a kid if they don't think that it's important or they feel different or they feel however they feel um, they're not going to use it and they're not going to um, be successful with it Um, and so something that I've had to do in the past is student training like peer training on a device um, with family permission and you know administrative permission uh, permission and all that but Um, so something that I had to do in the past was go into like classrooms, um, and bring different types of systems. Um, and maybe we play games and we let kids who use verbal communication and don't use, um, AAC at all, um, kind of learn about how AAC works and, um, give them that like awareness of it. Um, so that the kid who was on the device didn't feel different and didn't feel like people were looking at them differently. Um, and so I've done that and, um, I just feel like it was really cool to see these kids who are, you know, 13 years old, 12 and 13, who are just trying to figure out who they are and try and figure out, um, that it's okay that like people communicate in a different way. 
um, use different systems and the kid who was using the device really, I think, felt a lot of self-worth because we were doing that. Um, so I would like bring in game or something. I usually would bring that headbands game um, because I just felt like it's across the board. Everyone loves it and you could do, um, and we were just working on yes, no, just because that was the easiest. So um, I would bring the game into the classroom and there would be 20 kids or whatever it is in the classroom. And I would have a couple of different devices um, on my iPad or on different iPads and things um, and kind of pass them out and kids would take turns. Um, and then I'd also teach them just the basic signs of yes, no. Um, if they had their phone, we would have them download that speak app on their phone and they can use that. Um, and nobody was allowed to use their voice. Everyone had to use like a, AAC device of some sort. Um, and so it was really cool because, and I had to do this a couple different times, but it was really cool because every time I did this, um, the student who I was specifically supporting was just like totally, you could see on their face that they were just so elated and they were so, they felt so like so much self-worth and so much, um, assurance that like, it's okay to, you know, Feel like this and it's okay that people know um, how I'm how I'm expressing myself and um, and it's okay that and, feeling you know. of acceptance yeah 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 and it was I felt like that was just was just really cool and it was cool to see how the kids kind of reacted to it and how um, how cool they thought it was too that like you know there are so many different ways that you express yourself and now I would kind of compare it to like text messaging, right? Like you're talking to somebody on the phone, you're talking to somebody in person, you're texting, um, but no matter how you're talking to them, like what you're saying still, like you care about what you're saying and you like mean what you say. Um, so no matter how you express yourself, you're still, it's still valuable and it's so important. So I just felt like that was a really cool moment. And just thinking about like student perception was, something that I hadn't really thought of yeah. before. Um, so. I've done a few of those yeah. too. And one of my ahas was, uh, you know, I, I, I've done ability, you know, discovery ability days and I've done it from kindergarten all the way up through sixth grade. And even the sixth graders who have some literacy skills, if I told them they couldn't go to the keyboard and I said, you know, tell me what your favorite food is, they struggled to find it on the device. I had to model first what it could look like. And sometimes I had to model it a couple of times for them to be able to see how the device worked. So I, I need to video it on some, at some point because I think it's so important for other people to see that it has to be touched. It has to be shown in context for someone to understand the, the value and the purpose. Otherwise you can't just hand a tool to someone and say, go and expect them to figure it out. Cause it's just, you know, it'd be like figuring out the innards of a of an Apple product, like don't, I, there's no way I could figure out all that engineering if somebody just handed to me and said, oh, so, oh my gosh, I love that story. That, yeah. that's what it's all about, right? Like is making sure these kiddos feel accepted, feel understood and everybody, everybody around them gets it too. Oh yeah. I love it. <laughs> well, Amory, thank you so much for being on today. This was wonderful. I think that, you know, your, your thoughts and um, all your experiences are going to be so worthwhile for everyone to hear. And hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Well, thank you. I Hi, it's Cheryl Livingston, and I wanted to show you some free resources that are available on websites that um, we frequently talk about. Um, we know that, you know, weather's changing and so much um, time we have been spending outdoors. Well, now it's time to come indoors and maybe we need to play some games. Some board games would be fun. So let's look at a couple things that are uh, available to you. If I go to the Sotillo website, and that's Sotillo.com, I'm going to click on Implementation. And then I'm going to click on chat corner and I'm going to scroll down and they have all kinds of things here. Well worth your time uh, exploring, but I'm going to go to active with AAC and again, tons of stuff. Well, there's one right here that talks about board games. So here is an easy handout to print um, just to, or to refer to electronically about words that we might use when we're playing board games. Uh, phrases, how we can start with one word and build up to three words, some of the icons that are available on the um, 
uh, touch chat and uh, Nova chats. But again, quick and easy, any system that you're using, these could be app applicable. Then I also want you to know that PRC has the same thing. If I go to the PRC website, which is printrom.com, and I go to caregiver resources, and I go down to activities, again, this is all free. If I go to their tab, which says active with AAC, we're going to find another one with board games. And again, both systems um, have basically the same words that you could be act choosing to uh, address. But again, they have a little bit difference as far as the icons that that might be um, showing. If you scroll down, you'll see both on the PRC and the Sotelo, there are paper versions of these books that we can print and then just add these uh, tabs at the top to be more specific to playing board games. So again, free and easy, can't beat that. And definitely something that will expand how much fun a board game can be. Thanks. Hi, it's Cheryl. And we were just talking about vocabulary for board games that are available on handouts from Saltello and PRC and could be used with any system. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about what that might look like. So I have a board game on my screen that I uh, found on Lesson Picks. And I'm going to, you know, just say, well, we've got our little pieces here. So this could be definitely a live um, material board game versus an electronic one. But I'm going to show you with this on the computer screen. So I could use some of those vocabulary and I could ask, you know, so what? And they say, well, what? And then they could tell me red. So, okay, you're red and I'm going to be green. All right. So we got our pieces ready to go. And so then we could say, well, what now? What do we need to do? And they could use a word like turn. It's like, oh yeah, it is your turn. So we could spin a dice. We could pull out a picture out of a hat, whatever would work best for you. And I could say, well, which one should we be looking at here? What do you think you're going to get? And let's say they got over. And I said, okay, we're going to move your piece to over. So we go one, two, three, over. And then I could also then say, well, it's my turn. So what am I going to get? And I pull one or I roll the dice and I get a five. So I'm going to move to five spaces. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I got under. He's under the box. And then again, we could have more words that we're putting together. Um, you know, as far as something that maybe they want to say, um, what's next? They could want to say, um, open that. If I had something that we were looking at that we needed to open. So it's all available with just a matter of us having an interaction, having a chance to expand. So um, I could be saying, well, I got in, I got in, where is in? And they could tell me, put it here. And they could be pointing here. And I said, oh, okay. So I got in and I'm going to move mine to in. So just a little idea of kind of what that would look like. And then definitely we could go for again, let's play again, or that was fun, or I win. The last thing that we want to show you is just how you can customize your vocabulary set for your student to help things be more accessible and ready for gameplay. So we're going to show you three systems quickly. Um, as Cheryl mentioned in her videos, you can utilize core language with any of these systems and you can have the student direct the activity by saying things like you, you go, go versus I, I go, go. Um, my, my turn, turn versus your, your turn. turn. You can have them comment by saying good job. Good job. Um, you can have them say protests by saying things like stop, stop. you're cheating. That. Stop that. Um, you can also have them end the game by saying things like stop. So you can do that in any of our systems. Um, if you want, if the student is not working on core language and you're working on more pragmatic functions um, and they have some intact language and you really want to expedite their message delivery, you can also use some topic based pages to. Um, support specific things they might say in the board game itself. In touch chat, um, this is a word power 60 basic and you can on your word power systems under touch chat or Nova chats you can go under groups and then down here at the bottom they have toys and games 
and you can see that they have some similar language to the core page um, with some topic based toys that you might play with. Um, if you're in the middle of a board game, you can use your core language um, and you can also have these other links like again, position words, or you can put in some phrases that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, go to games, here's some more games that you might be able to utilize, and use some of these blank buttons to formulate some things you might say in that um, in that game. You could also make a copy of this page and put it under a game like bingo or checkers uh, to have something more specific or even like hide and seek you might say something like ready or not here I come um, under that page. So know that those are all options for touch chat. If you were doing something like your unity symbols, um, your lamp words for life or your unity sequenced you can use, again, you can use your core, so you can say things like go, um, but you can also use some topic-based phrases under the have fun, which is on the activity row for your Unity Sequenced. If you're on Lamp Words for Life, you're going to want to create this page under a sub-page, so talk to your facil facilitator about where you might want to put that. Um, you can put it under the play page, under the dice, that's a really good spot. But you can see that when you're on this activity row, you have some different games that you might play. So if we wanted to explore iSpy, it takes us to an iSpy page and it has some activity specific things you might say. This is going to be for an older user, maybe um, even with some literacy or pre-literacy skills and they can say things like, you got it wrong, you got it, you guessed what I was trying to tell you, um, I spy with my little eye, something that begins with the letter L, and then the person can guess and you can give clues. Um, versus a different have fun game, like if you were playing a board game, like Cheryl's game, you might say things like my turn, your turn, uh, deal the cards, move the piece, roll the dice, go fish. No cheating, which is my favorite one. Um, I will oftentimes cheat intentionally to see if I can engage the child to tell me no cheating. And then uh, again, hide and seek, uno. You've got different things on here that would be very specific to that game. So these can all be programmed. This is just meant to be an example. Um, one really nice thing on Unity is it does have a randomizer, so you can roll the dice within the game, or within the uh, device itself. So if I hit roll dice once, it gives me a three and a four. If I hit it again, it randomizes that. Um, same thing for bingo. It lets, lets the user call out bingo cards. So again, if you're interested in having something specific like that, programmed on your device, talk to your facilitator and we can tell you um, if and how it can be done. Then the last we want to show you is just uh, Snap Plus Core first, your Snap, Snap Core first. And in Snap Core first, again, you have your core vocabulary that can be um, combined to direct the activity and comment. And you also have uh, an area called Topics. So if I go to Topics and I scroll down, Sorry about that. If I scroll down, there's a gameplay one, and on this gameplay one, you can see that I can say some things like, "Do you want to play a game?" Ask some questions. Uh, Whose turn is it? I can direct the activity by saying, "Let's play a new game." It's my turn. It's your turn. Um, let me see. I need another. And then you can say positive comments or negative comments. Again, depending upon what your goals are for your student, you can personalize this. Uh, you can also add these to a more core-based system um, to kind of help your student pragmatically learn different pragmatic functions like requesting versus uh, asking a question versus commenting versus terminating the activity. So it's available for you um, while you're playing your board games in your sessions and in your classrooms. Uh, we encourage you to reach out if you have questions. So we hope that you enjoyed the resources that we shared uh, today and got some great insights uh, from Anne-Marie and from, from what we've talked about. 
Yeah, I, I love the part where she talked about going into the classroom with the peers and having them experience what, it, you know, AAC is all about. Um, I remember hearing about the young man she was supporting. Um, I think it was a degenerative situation and he was very hesitant. He, he, he realized that, you know, his life was changing and that um, things were getting harder, but he didn't want people to I guess feel sorry for him and call attention to it, but by bringing, so he was hesitant to use his system, but by bringing in his peers, things turned around and he definitely, you know, I think felt so much better and they, they definitely saw an increase in his amount of um, use of his device. So, so that was wonderful that she took the time to do that. Yeah. Well, and, and peers in the classroom, peers at home, like tap into that. I know a lot of people have been saying how uh, they've been working with siblings because siblings mm -hmm. have been home during this time mm -hmm. of, of COVID and, and just how positive and how receptive they are to, to touching devices, using devices, modeling on devices. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was talking to a family yesterday uh, about a system and I was like, yeah, how, you know, like just if they are thinking they want to, uh, to be comedic relief because they were saying how they always joke right in the background i was like have them go to the jokes page you know like mm -hmm. halloween might be over but just have them have them go to the oh, jokes yeah. page and practice and practice their stand-up i was gonna say they could be a stand-up comedian one day yeah yeah yeah, yeah because yeah. the the student is so motivated by siblings right like there's a great yeah. video out there too the the fart video <laughs> and the diarrhea video <laughs> I love to show it in a couple of my classes where they're sitting around the table, like being siblings and they, the, 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 uh, the kiddo that is using AAC, what does he say, Cheryl? Do you remember? He says, well, I don't remember how it starts, but I know it's a boy. That's the other part of this story is boys are always motivated by farts. True. So <laughs> I think he, he goes, she says something about what do you want for dinner? And, uh, eventually it turns to poo poo. Poo poo, and they all laugh, and then the sibling takes the device, and then the kiddo says poo poo, but then he adds on and says diarrhea, and they just like bust out laughing because, of course, that's kid talk, right? And that's exactly what many a many a dinner table has heard <laughs> across the nation <laughs> from all their kids. So yeah, and that's what I love too is about the more we make it just typical bantering, teasing poking fun at, you know, that's life. That's what we want. Yeah. yeah. Playing games, like that's having motivated. conversations, <laughs> right? Quality, quality <laughs> yeah. conversations. So yeah. Yeah. anyway, we hope you have a wonderful week ahead and we just want to thank you for listening and uh, tune in next time. We'll be sharing more tips and resources. Uh, this is Laura Hayes. And I'm Cheryl Livingston. And this is AAC Innovations. Talk to you See soon. You later. <laughs>